I made these sunflower plates and it was just me playing around one day and it was right when Ukrainian war started and I just felt like sunflower was the thing to do. Um, so I had a lot of pieces of three quarter inch maple and I made these little plates and then I started doing stuff with them. Um, and so I'm gonna take you through the process. And when I think about it, first, I, I really have never used a screw chuck or a face plate before, and these were so little that on YouTube, I found a video on how to do it without it. So I basically take my piece of wood and I round it on the bandsaw and I put it up against the chuck and I make the chuck width appropriate to hold it steady. And then using tailstock support, I make maybe a one eighth inch tenon. It doesn't have to be a lot, just enough to hold it so I can turn it around and make the mortise. And then when I've got it on this side, I do any embellishing. I usually put a little swirly or anything I want to do and sand it. And if I think I'm going to do something artistic to the back, I go ahead and put my uh, lines on it while the wheel's turning so I kind of have the right spacing. Now, I didn't think to do that till these were done, so it was a little bit trickier because they weren't actually balanced, but it helps if you're embellishing in the back to keep you on the right, in the right lane. Um, what I do with them uh, when I place them out, I've looked at a lot of videos and pictures of sunflowers, and since there are so many varieties, I can make one up because some of them have wider, longer petals, some of them have a smaller center, some of the center's concave, some is convex, some are different colors, so I have my own version. And however it turns out with my oops, this is the version I get. So the first thing I do is lay out my petals with a pencil. Yeah. And I just kind of guideline them and come down here and I maybe go do the four C's in between. And then as I'm doing, I'm like, okay, the petals are going to have to overlap because I want to get layers in. So I really just look at it and say, okay, you're going to be behind here. And I sometimes erase it. And when I carve it, sometimes I do it differently because it's just not working right or I have an oops. And everything I'm about to show you is not necessarily the right way to do things. It's my way to do things. Um, I'm a trial by error. If I'm using a burr and it's just not working, I take it out and I find another one and I keep going till it works. So I can't even tell you which ones work. I just know by the feel of it. And eventually I hope to have my favorites. But right now, if something doesn't work, I just try something different. Um, and once I get them all laid out, there'll be a few that are going to be just hidden in the background. So then the next thing I do after putting on eye protection and respirator protection, which I won't do here, and I won't say whether or not I do it at home, but I'm recommending it, I have a big exhaust fan in front of me. So I actually wear ear protection as well because it's so loud. And I actually jam to music at the same time. So the speed that I go is in tune to the music, which is sometimes bad because you get going too fast and you make mistakes, but it does keep me focused on it. And I try with non-words, so it's just music. So once I get that done, I start with the carver, and with a very, uh, very fine piece. Oop, need my instructions. I just go along. Where's the piece that I didn't finish here? Pencils, and I just kind of score, and I kind of keep my finger out to support the plate, and I just come along here. And I sometimes turn the piece. Once my hand's in position, I try not to move it, and I turn the piece. And I don't always follow my lines. They're a guideline. And these are really just scores to take another tool in there and do it bigger, but this kind of guides it so you don't get all the skipping around. And I'll just come down here. And oops are okay because the amount of carving and sanding and stuff I do to this, you don't have to be careful because um, I do every state. Like I go back and forth from carving and burning and sanding, and I'm like, oh, I take out too much. I got to carve again. Again, because I'm not an expert at this. This is just my way. So, again, I would just come in here and follow the line down and follow the line down here. And think about my little triangles on the corner. And again, I'm going to come back and burn them down. And once I've gone around, let me see if I've got all of the lines in here. Nope, just a few more. And whatever is comfortable, but I'm always turning the piece because once I have my hand where I feel it's in a good position, I really don't want to move it. And I'm sorry I'm a little shaky today because I spent all day working on something and I think my hands are in trauma. <laughs> I should have stopped earlier. So again, I'm just getting all the lines 
that one's going to be behind. And I'll come along here. There's another one. And at this point, it doesn't really matter which leaf is on top. It just matters that one's on top of the other. Or later, I'll figure out the depth, which looks right. I'm constantly taking it like this and looking at it and saying, no, you need to be on top and switching it around. So once I've gone around all of this, let's see if I have a few more left, I want to come in with a bigger tool. It doesn't look that much bigger. but it's a little rougher. Oh, another thing about using these is some of them need a collet because there's different size shanks. And there's so many times I have just pulled this out and my little collet has gone flying. Once I had to replace one, but my little dog finds them for me. <laughs> but I always have to remember when I pull these things out to make sure that I got my fingers on the collet because they roll forever. Yeah. So now I have a backup one, and the one I found, she'd shoot it so much that it was never going to be right. So, and I have lost this one, but I found it again after crawling on the floor for a half hour. All right, so this one's is just a little bit better. It's still sharp on the edges, so I can get under there. So then I would come along and, and it, I do it on an angle because I'm trying to get depth and curvature to my leaves. And I think about which one's going underneath. So this one's on top, so I'm going underneath here. And it's helpful to keep your finger out here because it adds support. And I go very slow, fast, you'll skate. And so I go ahead and get all these lines and my levels, which one's over. This one's on top, so I'm going to come down here more. This one. And I'll go around and get them deeper. And when I get them done, I now have a plate that I've gone around and I've got a lot deeper lines and I've started making them a no, skiers, so I call them moguls, um, but the hills and valleys and the curvatures. And um, oh, let me go back to design. One of the things I didn't do when I made these five plates is think about the flowers. Um, technically, you want your flowers maybe to curve over a little bit and not be so flat. Um, think about the wind if they're blowing and you want to think about how the underneath side and all of these are epic failures because if you had a regular platter you're going to eat off you need to grip it by something and it needs to be wide enough on these I really didn't think about the bottom so it's just something to think about when you're making the plates before you ever get to the embellishment is what's your form going to look like and I have failed in that but my last one is pretty good so so anyway this is the second one and I've done some of that heavier carving and then I've taken call it. I'll take one of these and I don't even know what they're called. Um, I think these are carbide. I first learned all of this. I went out to Don and Kathy's and Kathy spent a day with me in the MDI catalog and walking through what I didn't need, what I did need. And it was very, very helpful. And I went home and spent a lot of money. So on this one, when I want to make them, I'll just start and then maybe coming down this way. So maybe the leaf has a little indent this way. And if it's one that goes underneath, I definitely want to make it like it's planted. So I just kind of, and don't really worry about scratches or anything else because you're going to be embellishing it so much that you're going to undo and redo your scratches until you get to the sanding and then you're a little bit more careful. So in here I go through and I just pull in these indulations and I might come down this way. Where's another one here? This one's not too good. Now, I'm not doing it now, but usually I'm wearing this headset, and it has several different lenses that slide into it, and it has LED lights that's rechargeable. And I'm not marketing this, but I've found this has made such a difference in the quality of my work, being able to see. Um, and the lenses, there's like six of them, and they can be combined to make any strength you want. Um, and it's really been great. I'm not doing it now because it's easier and not demonstrated. So I would just come in here, round down the edges, get some depth, and make sure I'm in here, and come down in here. And some of these have already done a little bit, try not to make too much of a mess, and feel that they rotate, and sometimes the way the light is, you're not really seeing it. But once you get all them done,
Number three. So on this one, I finished doing all of the undulations for the most part. It probably could use a little bit more touching up. And that's the point where then I kick out the burner and let that come up. I have a problem with this burner. Um, it's one recommend to me, and I love it, but my cables, if I'm not in the right stretch or curve, I have like shorts in them or something. And it's like I was before testing, are they going to turn up oh, wrong side? Um, sometimes I have to like make sure this is over this way or that way. It's just been such a pain. I've tried gig gimmicks and tape and support systems, and I don't know where it is. And it's both cables, it's both handsets, so I haven't been able to eliminate what the problem is. But I'm red hot right now, <laughs> so it's working. So then um, I would come along and kind of undercut more with the burn. I'm gonna blow it at you, Daniel. Um, yeah, and again, if this doesn't work, I'll try something different. I like the skew with the curve because I feel like I can control it as I'm going around the curve. And so I just come in here and really, and another thing I do is a lot of times before I heat it up is I will sharpen it and get it so it's more cutting than burning and it helps me get under the wood. And it's a little high here because I was taking with turn it down a bit. And I'll just find all these things here and and I'm turning the plate, as you notice. And the trick that didn't happen is to really be steady and know your pressure and your speed and maintain it. Because any stop and go will change and the pressure will change. And once you feel like you've hit that sweet spot, just try to hold it steady. And it takes practice and tool control. So the other thing I'll do is I'll come in here and you can see I've some of these triangles have been burned in here. I'll come in here and get underneath so it adds that dimension, like the petals are sitting on a plate. And the other thing I'll do now is on the edge. I want it to look like the leaves fold over the edge and come to a point. So I will, can you see that? I will come along here and say, okay, we're gonna burn you that way and you need to be a little bit more burned that way and maybe get you a little pointier and so that the leaves look more natural than just like you went around it with a piece of sandpaper. And I will actually do some sanding to round off the curbs. And then once I have all of these triangles, I call them, I can also just come here and burn it in and here. And I'm going probably in a 16th of an inch. I've pre-sharpened these. This one here, I wanna get under. And if I come up here, I want to take it to the side a little bit more. And my hands are weak because I'm shaky. So I'm not going to keep burning because I don't want to put so much smoke in the air and I have another plate. But I basically uh, go around, do all of that. And then I realize, oh, it's not looking so great. So then I go back and I have to go back to the burr and shape it again, which usually takes away a lot of the black lines, which I like for the depth. In the past on these, I've used um, dyes and I started out with water-based dyes and they actually left a lot of fuzz, but it was a flower and they're fuzzy. So I was okay with that. And then I learned about alcohol-based dyes. So my next one was gonna be those. But now I've learned so much about dry brush painting, I'm actually going to take my finished plate and dye it, color it totally black. So the burn lines aren't going to really matter so much. I could do the same with the burrs. And then I'm going to dry brush it and go lighter and lighter to the Jack Vessery 50 shades of paint. Yes. Um, it's where you put just a little bit of paint on your brush and you you get most of it off by dabbing it, but you never put a lot. And if you can touch it to your your skin and feel paint, you got too much. And then you just very like if this was your brush, very. And it, um, when I sat in with Jack Vesper, he uses a called a deer foot brush, and it's angled and looks like a hoof. And it just very lightly. The lighter, the better. And usually, like when I did this piece here. I had black everywhere, and then I added just a tinge of blue to the black. And it took five coats before you ever even saw a change. And then I would add just a little bit more blue to the black. And eventually I'd add a little white, and I would get lighter and lighter. And then, because I wanted some green in here, I did yellow, because otherwise it wasn't going to work. And the yellow went around it. And again, it's a dry brush. 
And then I also learned that you can take white and go over it, and it highlights, but then go back over with your dark color, and it kind of just pops through and adds highlights to it. So that's the technique I used on this, and this is what, that's what I want to use on these, go from black to the reds and the oranges and the yellows of the flower. So once I've finished burning in all my triangles, we're doing really fast here. Am I speaking too fast? Um, I've got everything burned in, all the triangles done, I've sanded this, I've got probably not the best job of um, my moguls in here, and I don't care about all this because I'll sand some more and either take um, alcohol, not alcohol, um, Would, whatever works, I try not to go too coarse of a grip because that just adds more problems, and I will either take I have these pencils, not pencils, but these sanding sticks that have color coded with different grits. And like this is a 180 here. I can't remember the color, so I markered them. And I might just come in here and smooth out the rough edges that are inevitably going to happen, especially because I'm not an expert at this, so I'm going to have a lot of issues. And I just sand around the corners. Or I like this foam back stuff I picked up in Chattanooga. And this is 240, and I like because it bends so you don't do it. And I'll actually come in here and I can squeeze it in, get the lines out. I make sure I really scum down here. I will use some of these balls. Are they the diamond balls, I think it's called? I'm not sure. Like I said, I, um, I have my own ways. And this one I can come in and kind of sand edges, take out anything that looks like it shouldn't be there, hold it up to the light, fix things up, round the edges. What Kat had taught me after you do your undercuts is you want to kind of round your thing over a little bit without losing your undercuts, and it makes it have more depth. So that's kind of what I'm doing here. It's big enough it doesn't go down into the crevices and ruin my undercut, but I can come along here and just round down my edges. And I can take off some of that brown stuff, too. And then just come around. I get it nice and smooth. Now, if I had left the profile of this plate a little bit more rounded, half of my work would be taken care of. And I did on the last plate, I have to remember to do that. I'm not sure why, but I was just like, I can knock these five plates out in a day and they'll be ready to go. So I was ready to leave for France and I wanted to be ready for this. And I didn't really think about form. And no matter how much color or embellishing you do, if you don't have good form, you don't have good art. So I would have probably raised this up and had them come up in a profile and down, and then I would have had less work to do to get there. Again, on all five of these, I have put lines around the back so I could do a basket weave or any type of embellishing um, with special handmade, maybe uh, tips for the burner, or whatever you want to do. You could do um, cuppers, basket weaves, or whatever. So now I've got all this done, it's time to do the middle. And that's where I use the cup burrs. Make sure I got my collet. And I pick one out that looks about the right size. This looks like an eighth of an inch, maybe, because it looks about proportionate. And I want to make all the little, what do they call it, stamens or whatever in plants. I don't know my stuff. I didn't attend school as much as I should. So what I've learned about these cup furs is you think, all right, we'll get them on fast. I'll just go in and we'll go in here and we'll make a hole. And what you're going to have is going to go do, 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 all over the place and mess up your art. And you're going to cuss and go have a glass of wine and come back to it the next day. So you've lost a day. So what I have found that is you need to make sure you've got the right speed because it's really the heat that burns them in. And start anywhere. From the time I tried to do 
um, a spiral pattern, but eventually it unspirals and then it looks like you started and didn't finish the spiral pattern, so it's better to be random in the beginning and it was all planned that way. So make sure you put the edge, can you see that good? Edge down first and then lift up and see even then it skits. And I see the smoke coming, and now I've got that first burr. And then set it down very close to the edge, because what you don't want is a bunch of little holes with little rivers of land around them. You want them to overlap enough, because you won't notice it until you brush off all of the carbon, and you get ready to paint it, and you see all the flat spots. So it's really hard to get close, and sometimes you ruin a previous one, but when you get them all clustered together, you really won't notice those oops. So again, I'm putting it down on the edge. And if it's, and what I also found I learned, Jacques was telling me, um, sometimes you got to go back over them when you're all done. Go back over and clean them up. One more. Do what? Yes. And what you do is you set here and into your brush brush. Because if you notice that the whole, the domes are kind of flattened out, it's because you've got crap up in there and it's not turning. So almost every couple of them, I just take the brush and do that, and a little on the outside. And then I'll come in here on the edge and tip up. I almost can tell by the amount of smoke when I'm done, kind of like burn wires. And then I come into another one. It's probably the lights. Is that better? Can you see it now? Any better? And then you just come in here. So I'm not going to go do all that because I know the smoke is bad, but I have another plate. And I would just go around, do all of them. I would take the wire brush, really scrape them to see what I actually have. Yeah, I don't do the center to the petals or the way I like them. Because a lot of times I'm also holding it like this the whole time and all. And I think that's the easy part. That's the no-brainer. Um, but the petals are more that you have to do them. So I would just go around this whole thing and do those, um, making sure there's no little things. I don't know if you can see right there. I've got a little flat spot there. But when I come around the second time, I'll just go that 0.1 millimeters over to the right and take it out. Um, and then I would paint it and then dry brush paint to get the highlights because you don't want it flat to add the texture to it. So number five, pass that around, request. Not painted, well, it's done except for painting. But I didn't think I would be able to paint in here and do it right. And I actually want to try the new method of making it all black using black um, gecko. Gesso, gesso, gesso. I get use Golden's product. It's a flat black, and it works as a primer. But I like because it's very black and flat. And I'm going to paint this whole whole thing black, and then I'm going to dry brush reds and golds and oranges and yellows to get to my version of a sunflower. And if it's too red, it's just a redder version of a sunflower. Um, but I might probably find a picture one for inspiration because I'm a very visual person. So I'm going to need to see one and really look at where is the red in that leaf? Is it on the edges or is it in the center? Is it at the tips? Because I've seen some sunflowers that are all yellow and then the tips are orange. So like I said, find one you like and imitate it. And if it doesn't work out, there's another one that matches. So on the back of this one, and I can show you that in the back of number three, I've used this um, basket weave um, tip. Now I used to do my basket weave with a straight skew and just do you know three or four lines and turn them and so forth. And I could do that going around. If I had a screw in here, I can show you. I could take this skew and go around in one, two, three, one, two, three, or depending on how wide I made these and do it, and it would come out okay. But I had this basket weave one, and I thought I would try that one out now that I'm getting better at using these tools. 
and it's got a lot of carbon on it there. And this one is what I did to the back of this one is I went around and I did, I think I went two this way, and then I went this way and this way. I found if you go all the way around and try to do your next row, it doesn't work out because obviously it's a shorter distance around the center than it is the outside. And if you're just trying to do two, 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 or two, 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 when you get to the outside, you're going to have missing gaps. And I'll pass this one around, and it has plenty of mistakes in it because I got to the outside, and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do? So I'm hoping that the paint and texturing and everything I do to it will hide those little pieces. Um, and I probably should have gone more slowly, but I really wanted to get it done. I'll go ahead and put this in here and show you. This is the burner that was recommended to me, and I like it because he's got two ports on it, so I'm not always having to change out. Even though you can only use one at a time, I don't always have to change it out. And if I do have to change it out, I can put the hot one back, pick up the cold one, change that, and not wait for the other one to cool off. Another thing is, is when you're done with the cup version, you go to take them out of the handle, do not touch them. How would I know that? <laughs> It was an oh moment, and um, it was very thanks. And now I keep pliers handy, and I pull them out with pliers and set them in a burn-proof area because I'm always saying I was going to start burning the table next. As they get very, very hot, as you can see from the smoke. So this one's getting pretty red hot, so I'm going to turn it down a little bit and show you on – I like these skinny lines better. I might go ahead and say – and on this one, too, when I put this one down, if you don't rock it, you don't get the eve ends. And I can show you that if I just go, it's a little uneven, but so I kind of put it down and just rock it to make sure it hits on all surfaces. And then I would come here, and then I would go this way. And if they don't match up, what's the nice thing of these coils is that you can put it right down in place and give it a little slide. So you can see the distance between those two. I'm not sure if you can see that from here. So I'm going to go right back on top of it and just push it forward a little bit and go to the other one and push it towards me. And now they've married up. And then I come back down to this one. And these lines are probably not the right size, so I'm going to kind of ignore them. And now I've got enough to go to here. And again, they didn't line up, so I just push it forward to whatever side I need to. I see this one up here and push forward. Then you can come around, see that one went this way, so I've got to go this way. And then this way. Oops, and that one didn't come out right. So this is very forgiving. I found if you use the skew and you mess up, you're kind of skewed. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, usually I keep my hair in a ponytail for flare-ups. So anyway, that, the, let me see. it looks kind of contrasty. You can't see. I'll pass it around. I'll turn this off now. But that's how I do the back of them now. And I can't wait to paint this and see what I can do with many layers of paint. And I want it to look like straw, a straw basket. So I'm going to start with black and get to honey, gold, and wheat, whatever you want to call it, to that color. But because you do so many layers of the paint, layers of the paint, it adds depth. The blacks never go away. Even in here, it's like there's blue in there, there's green in there. But you first look at it, you think it's green, but then you see the other colors. And that's what I want to have with this, is to have it look like there's some depth to it. And in the shadows, there's some darkness. When you say you paint it, you're only dry brushing it. Right. I'll use a regular brush and go over it with the black gesso, and then I'll get my gla uh, my helmet on thing, and I'll get really close because anytime you paint it, every time you look, oh, there's a little pinhole spot that didn't get paint, and you keep going around it. And that was with this one, and trying to paint in and get everything in there and make sure I didn't have maple showing through. And it took one of those little tiny two-millimeter 
model airplane paint brushes and just going in there and just dabbing them even to get into the hole but yeah i will dry brush this and i'll st i haven't tried it yet so i can't wait to see how it goes um and then i'll go over it with red with the black until i get some shades of red and then i'll just slowly add yellow to get to the oranges and eventually get to the yellows because you can always start dark and go light if you go light it's hard to go back to light When you started this out, you were mentioning when you were learning, you went to a couple of mentors, you mentioned Kathy. Don and Kathy, Don Penny and Kathy McCall live out on the west side. And I was just starting, this was probably three years ago, it was before COVID actually. Um, yeah, it was about three years ago and I knew she was great at carving and I just, someone saw me to get me kicked off so I didn't get started with bad habits or buy the wrong stuff. And it was great. I brought all my stuff that I, I bought a burner and a thing she's put it away or use mine and she sat down and went through the different um tips with me and why there are different ways because some are very tapered i think you're the t overhead i don't know if you can tell that but they come very very tapered and then some of them the points are sharp and some of them the points are dull because sometimes when you're cutting in you don't want it to be cutting in you only want it to be cutting on the sides so depending on what you're doing whether you want and i have to go through here and like this to find which ones are which because they're all out of order some of them are more tapered and longer some of them are more like cylinders um some of them the taper is more defined um it just depends on what area you're trying to get into so she talked me through that. She told me about the big thing with the extractor, which has been great, but trying to get a refill on that filter has been hard. I've blown it out with the air compressor as many times as I can. Um, and it's a company called Camfill, and I call them the 800 number, and like, oh, well, you're not in our region. You need a Florida dealer. So I call the Florida dealer, and they're like, oh, we don't have them. Here's a number for Orlando. I haven't gotten there, because I think I can find any filter, and I'm just going to start looking for a 16-inch filter. Um, but definitely use the extractor. I use this sandbag here. It's actually got rice in it that helps me mold, hold things in place or to prompt them. Um, I think I would change to sand because sand doesn't burn. Learned that in Nick Agar's studio that he's all filled with sand and we're in Florida, we can find the sand. So I'm probably when I remake this and I want it to be bigger, but it is helpful because you can really get something in there steady and hold on to it. Tracy, I don't know what an extractor is. But can you it's a dust extractor. It's a big, heavy fan with a filter in front of it. And it's like 16 by 16 filter. It's about this thick. They're smaller ones. And it's in the MDI, what is it called? MDI wood turn, what's something catalyzed? It's called MDI. Um, but they're big on um, turning and carving tools. And I use that. And it, it really is very helpful. It's loud, which is why I put my earbuds in uh, to make up for because my watch keeps telling me about my loud environment exposure. So I decided that I already don't hear well. I might as well say it. And I really like listening to music. I mean, sometimes I'm in there sanding away, you know, to the Rolling Stones. <laughs> and some different beat will come up. And it actually keeps you going in it, especially doing these. Um, no, when I was doing these dots, it was like, do 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 And it just kept going, and it really made it fine. Um, use a wire brush on your burrs a lot because they get conked up but i have one in here actually got pieces of brass wrapped around it but use them a lot to keep them clean um even on the burner ones they get carbon built up on them so you want to clean them a lot and you'll notice the difference right away and i always do sharpen them i think it's something that um i forget her name now i had it here a minute ago did i put it back in here the a little uh for sharpening. I just always sharpen these up and Donna Banfield and sharpen them. And that way you're actually cutting and not just burning and it'll go into the wood easier and you'll have less chance of burning on the inside. Where's my paper? See, I'm, I'm sure I forgot something because I went so fast. So I've talked about ease of handling in the shape and the thickness at the rim. Like you can't really pick this up because when you see the profile of it, it's not good and it doesn't match. But I was so concerned about just getting the plates ready that I didn't think, and I'm, I'm hating that. Um, I use the chuck to create the tenon and the mortise and the sand away the tool marks. But because I know I'm going to be carving this up, I don't worry too much. I get it to about 240, no major tool marks. I don't care about sanding scratches because obviously I'm 
checking it all up. I used to spend so much time making it perfect. And then I get in there and carve it up. I'm like, well, that was an hour wasted. So I start thinking as the more I've done these, I've learned the shortcuts. Like, well, don't start burning too fast because you're going to get back in there and recut it or you're going to sand it away and then have to do it again. So, again, like I said, I'm not an expert at this. I've had informal training and it's learn as I go. And if one tool doesn't work, another one will. This one I really like that I bought in Chattanooga. Um, it looks like a spin top, actually. Um, but it's great for going around and getting under in there, and and it'll cut in there as opposed to burning in there. And I've used that one on the triangles a lot to get in here. Um, I start out to review with a light scoring, just kind of outlining the, the number one, outlining where the petals go, making sure you have overlapping petals and know which ones are going to turn. And even petals sometimes in the wind will curve. So they don't have to be perfectly symmetrical petals. Think about nature. It's not perfect or the wind's gotten it or a bug's eaten the corner or it's a windy day and they're just moving around. So I just try to make it look more free from. My first one was so flat. And the next, each one got better and I kept adding dimension. Um, the cuts talked about undercuts and then rounding things over um, makes them have more depth, but don't take away from it because I've spent a lot of time undercutting, sanding, undercutting, sanding because I keep undoing my work. So pay attention. Yes, MDI Wood Carver Supply, and they've got a big selection of stuff in there. I think I even got these sanding things, and they come with a bunch of bands. So this thing like squeezes together. So you can take the band off and you can also squeeze it together and just rotate the band to a clean spot. And then you have this rounded portion or this straight portion, which I can then get in here. And in a, in a clinch, I can file my nails. I decided to start making my own emery boards. <laughs> um, I also use these, another Kathy suggestion, um, the set of these sanding tools. And they can really help you either using the back curve or something to go around it or to dig into something. These are probably 240 grit, I'm guessing. They're not real coarse, but they will help you with either a pointy end or a shovel-like end. And like you can go down like this with them or curve around like that. So I just keep trying different things, but I usually always come back I always love my little pieces of sandpaper with the foam back. I feel like I can turn, bend, manipulate them, get my nail under it, and really get in there and, and do it. But it's just practice. I think Jack Vesey said, nobody plays the piano perfectly the first time they learn. It takes lots of practice. Well, nobody can paint the first time and get it right. You have to practice, but eventually. I did argue. I said I would never be able to play the piano. I have a deaf ear. But if you do something enough, you'll get decent at it. So that is all I have. I can pass this one around. Uh, well, um, before I was using the, was it Chromacraft? I used some, no, I had another brand I used of the water-based dyes. Then I bought the Chromacraft alcohol-based dyes, but I haven't done a sunflower plate with them yet. They're for something else. But now that I've learned about all this dry brush painting and seen what you can do with it, that's why I want to paint this whole thing black and then dry brush it to the colors that I want to get to. I'm using um, Golden makes them. Um, from what I learned from Jack, Golden's a one company that actually tests their paints thoroughly to make sure they're not going to fade and the colors stay true where others may not. And there's one called So Flat. He was using the... Um, not the high fluid, but the, the something flow, flow flat paint. But I think they change it now, and it's called So Flat by Golden. They sell them in Michaels and um, Hobby Lobby when you can find them, but Dick Blick has them, and you can buy them and then sets. And there's two, the pop colors and some other colors, like there's 12. And they're sure there's another one that aren't in sets. Uh, they're, not, they're not cheap. Um, but for what I do, I use so little, especially with the dry brush. And you literally would take like a three millimeter size drop and put it on your, your paper, your palette paper, um, something that doesn't absorb it. And then um, 
take your brush and just take a little bit of it and a little bit of it and smush it around till it looks like it's the right color and then wipe most of it off. I use palette paper that's absorbent on one side and like wax paper on the other side. So I actually take the piece of paper and fold it up a third or two thirds so that I keep the paint on the non-absorbing side and my dry brushing could come off. But if I get desperate, there's a paper towel, but I'm feeling I might get lint with that. But the test is to put it on your hand throughout the day my hand sometimes looks very creative is to just if you can touch the brush to your hand and see paint it's too much paint and the, when you put it on you should not see it going on but the repetition of just constantly doing this and I just sat there and turned it into this I think I was even watching TV just doing it really gently so you can't see it and the more it goes on like after the fifth stroke you might start seeing the color but this doesn't look like it's got 50 coats of paint it's not all like round it out and lose your dimension. He called Jack, Jack said it wasn't dry brushing. He called it his method, but I couldn't see any difference except you're know, just dry brushing. <laughs> but I did like the fact he uses the deer foot brushes. They're already on the angle and they taper. But I also found that a skinnier one for you ladies is an eyebrow brush because they're very firm and they're just a little bit on an angle. And when I needed to get into some of these little grooves, I went to my makeup kit and found it, and I was like, I know it'll work here. Washed it, dried it, and, and it worked really good, and it just got in there. Uh, yes, but I've also included, now I'm using the NSK, which is a um, dental tool running off the compressor. Um, pneumatic is the word I was looking for, um, and that, you go finer. The bits for that are like a one sixteenth inch, as opposed to the one eighth and what is it, thirty second? Yeah, and um, it doesn't skate as much. And you have to you can get into some fine, smaller stuff. And I actually have a, a router stand that come, you can get to go with it. It's made for it, so that if you want to keep your same depth, you can do it. And I recently had my cousin, an engineer, make me on his three um, D printer a different version with a very narrow base. So if you're trying to get in here, the base of the other one wouldn't allow it. So I've got now a one inch base and I like that. And I'm just waiting to ask them to make me one with like very little so that you never go deeper than you want to. You have to be careful with the NSKs because you can burn up the turbos really easily. So like if it starts screeching like you're in a dental chair, you need to pull back and do it little at a time. Like we even made a thing that shows your depth gauge one thirty second, one sixteenth, and you put it in there to get your depth. And like, if you carve it out, then you can go another little deeper and a little deeper. You never want to go full depth. But I love using it. I haven't used it enough yet. Um, but the birdhouse ornaments, I definitely used them. The one with the blue roof was definitely just kind of doing this to it. And when I did this, I used it, and it was nice to be able to get in those lines and not fall off of the grain lines that I was so diligently trying to follow. Yes, I had a good source. So a lot of the stuff I've been doing in maple and I just like working with it, the hard maple. Although I have some soft maple because I've learned like the, talking about the leather stamps, they don't work so much on hard maple. You really need a soft wood for them and a strong thing. I was so excited when I went to visit my sister who does leather tooling and she had all these tools and I took a piece of maple with me. It was hard maple. And I banged the heck out of that thing and there was nothing. And I was like, all right, soft maple's the trick. <laughs> Well, I'm sure basswood or something else, but I really just like working with maple because I am going to paint and embellish it. What other questions? Anybody been inspired to start carving or burning something? <laughs> I mean, you don't have to be an expert. You don't even know have to know what you're doing. Just be safe. Don't breathe in the fuse, wear eye protection, um, and don't lose your collet because you'll have to wait a week to get a new one. And, and don't worry about your mistakes because, you know, as we all say, design opportunities. If it doesn't work out, this one that's going around, if you look at the back, it's not a perfect thing, but it still looks good. And I'm learning. Everything I do, it's more about, well, I learned to do that and I learned what not to do. I don't care if it's a beautiful piece of art or not. I learned a lot. I do think this one's beautiful, but... Um, you just have to just keep trying it and try different things. People say, well, what are you making now? Because everyone says, oh, you still making? I was like, no, I'm learning something new. I probably won't make any more birdhouses. I got six sitting at home. I was like, I got to make something different now. So it's tremblers. Uh, 
Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, it is slow going to do these. Well, thank you, Tracy. I think we're... Any questions on Zoom? Were there any Zoom questions? Oh, you mean the chat? In the chat, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Don said old-fashioned milk paint. I don't know what that means. What is it? Don said old-fashioned milk paint. Milk paint, oh. No, I'm not, I have it. I bought samples, but I've never used it because I know when you mix it up, you got to use it. It doesn't last, so I haven't found a project that I want to do it yet. I'm sure one will come up. Uh, somebody asked if you had any experience using chalk paint. Mm -mm. Mm. I've used Luminaire. It's mm -hmm. a type of paint, luminaire, luminaire. for dry brush brushing. Mm -hmm. And that works out pretty well. Mm -hmm. I think strong paint is really thick. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like the milk paint, but thicker than dry brush. Tracy's first demonstration, everybody. Yeah. yeah. yeah actually, Woo! 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 Woo!